So you're fresh off the move too. So kind of, yeah. right? A couple of sales, not really the move. Right. What's, what's that been like? Uh, my wife's a saint. Like, like I went back, so, so I got so much to do here, right? So like I haven't wanted to go back and Julie's been coming here. And last week it was like, you know, dance recitals, um, selling. So we actually own two places there because we bought a little cabin on a lake for my parents. You know, I wanted my, my dad to be with me. And um, so we're selling both those houses and uh, like getting back there and feeling like the strain of every day, how long she's been doing that. Three kids. Her father was in a nursing home, recently passed away. So mm. she's burying her father. She's taking care of our three kids. She's coordinating the sales of two houses. She's coordinating the purchase of the house here. She's coordinating all these moves. Our son's staying in Charlotte next year. And I think it's hard that I'm like, you know, trying to FaceTime an 18 year old kid and can get him hyped up about Nebraska. Like it's just humbling when you get back there and see it. And um, I think I got there just in the nick of time <laughs> because I think, uh, you know, being there for, for last week really helped, you know. So there's two things that you said there. One, I'll go back to the night of the Jet Awards. Uh, we were just kind of shooting the breeze. And he said, hey, you know, I'd, I'd like to get back and go see Brian. He's, he's, he's flying into town. Yeah. And I, re I just, I remember kind of your sentiment, how you felt. You're like, I'm, I, and you said it out loud. You said, I miss my son. Yeah. And as a guy, you know, it's been five years now since I lost uh, my dad. And he was my, he's my best friend. Mm. Right. So right. Big night. I'm in seeing and all for the first 45, 50 minutes. I just was going to, I was trying to figure out how we can get you back <laughs> to Lincoln. ASAP, figure out. which it is, but it kind of leads me to believe. Cause you said you wanted your dad with you and cause that's important to you. The son of a pastor it's well documented, right? You have some of the mannerisms. You've talked about your affinity for high school coaches because he was a high school coach. Mm -hmm. What else is in there that that you draw from where you're like, you know what? I want my parents right where I'm at. I need my dad. I'm 47, 48 years old. I, I, need, I need those people in my life close to me. Well, you know, it, it kind of, it, it was an evolution, right? So my dad... So my first year at Temple, we went two and ten. The next year, he came down for like a, like a couple of days, like at the end of spring, at the end of spring, oh, excuse me, a fall camp, and we beat Vanderbilt in the first game. Which at the time, Vanderbilt was coming off a seven win season. We were huge underdogs. We beat him forty two seven. Yeah, that was Franklin, right? Yeah, just after he had left. That's okay. right. Derek Mason just took over, and it's a pretty big deal. So then the next year, my dad comes down for all of training camp, and. um we beat Penn State the first time for the first game for the first time in 74 years. And I'm not the smartest guy, but I was like, maybe you should move down here full time. And then they came down and we ended up winning a championship. And, um, but I just saw the impact, you know, my dad's a, you know, my dad's a, a spiritual man, a man of God. My mom is as well, but he's not someone like, you know, you could talk to my dad for 10 hours and you never hear him say a word. Uh, he, he lets his life speak for himself. And, um, and so I think the impact he has on people that are around him, I've, I've seen him, I've seen him build relationships with the toughest of kids, kids that, you know, come from trauma filled backgrounds, kids that, you know, you feel like, hey, could I ever have something in common with them? I've seen my dad just kind of naturally have a connection with them. And so that's helped me because in my job, for me to be good, I have to be me. Like I have to push people. I have to you know, grind things. I have to push buttons. And people always get to see this side of me, which is my dad. They get to see this side of me, which is my wife. I mean, even in the NFL, my wife has every single player over to our house every single year, like in season, Thursday nights, the one night that we're together, she's going to have a different position group over because she loves the players. And so they get to see like my dad, they get to see my wife, they get to see my kids. Like, you know, in the first week that I was here, all the, co the co coaches kids were running around the facility and it was like joy was back in my heart because that's what it was like at Temple and Baylor. So back to my dad, he, they ended up moving with us to Baylor, you know, it was a Christian university that had, you know, the football program at least had lost its way. And I needed, you know, like I, I'm a spiritual person, but I'm not my father. I needed someone like armed in the way that he's armed. And, you know, he, he'll do like a staff devotional for anybody that wants it. And I've seen guys on our staff who really maybe not, don't believe in anything um, come weekly because they feel fed and their mm -hmm. spirit feels fed. So um, I'm grateful for it. it. It's helped me through some really hard times. My my first year at Baylor, no one wanted me there. Um we're Owen, whatever. And my, my dad, he looked at me and he said, hey, hey, Matt, like, 
you're, you're going to rebuild Baylor football one relationship at a time. I just kind of stopped, like, and just turned to the players. And that if, if there's anything I hope that I do well, it's that I try to build relationships with the players as best I can. And that all kind of came from him. So, you know, he, he, they're going to stay in Charlotte. They're not going to come here to Nebraska. They're going to raise my son for me my senior year. And what's convicting and probably hard for me is like, like my son had another year. All I wanted to do was get my son through one high school. Like he's moved so much for me, sacrificed so much for me. I mean, this is our third move in six years. This is hard, but you know what? Um, he's in good hands. And I think for my son, um, he wanted to do this, but I recognize he's never going to live with me again. Like, you know, it, there's time for your kids to leave the nest. I just thought it was going to be next year, not this year. So that's the one, the hardest sacrifice. And if, People say like, you know, what took, you know, the, if I'm sorry if I'm talking too long, no. but if, that, if people sometimes wonder like what took us so long with they negotiating this, I was trying to come to terms with the fact that I wasn't going to be my son's at home father anymore. And I really wouldn't have taken this job. It, it's an amazing job and it's the right fit for me. Um, if Brian hadn't been like, take the job, you know, and he was trying to convince me to let him have his own apartment in Charlotte. And, and I was like, you know, I mean, you ain't living my, on your own until you're out of high school. So I think he had an end game there, but. But I, he wanted me to be here. He wanted to see me coach. And so, uh, but but family, like we, we came here because we thought this was right for our family. And I'm in this position because of my family. So I like to be around my family. And right now I'm not. So it's interesting. I'm listening to the, just the parallels are kind of uncanny, right? My I said, you know, my father was my best friend. And, and you know, his words of wisdom kind of supported a position change. I was a quarterback my whole life. And I didn't move to running back until I was a senior. And I just remember he was in education. Now he's assistant superintendent. Uh, he was the first black coach to win a national championship at a predominantly white university, won two wrestling national championships in, at, at then Omaha, which is now UNO. And I remember clearly, and I say this because you talked about as an adult, your relationship with your dad. So I've, which made me think, okay, I fought this mystique, this, this prowess, this image, if you will, even though I knew he, he's a good man that wanted to do good for his family. I remember kind of swimming upstream, right? Here's a, here's an African-American male in a position of leadership in the school district. And you know, people called us the Huxtables. And I, I, I just knew in my heart, I'm like, okay, I'm going to be too black for some, not black enough for others. So I was trying to figure out how I was going to be. And you, did you ever struggle with that growing up? Because you immediately fast forwarded to the impact he had when you were an adult. What was it like in the, those formative years that allowed you to know that, hey, when he's coming down to camp, that's somebody that I want to be around? Yeah, you know, I, I've, I've never heard my, my father, not only have I never heard my parents even argue, I've never heard him say a cross word. Mm. And at the same time, like, like my dad coached me, he's a tough man. And so I, I learned early on that you can be, you can, you can be really tough and like, hold people accountable. And, and also like, we had standards in our house. Like I don't like my, my kids go stay at my parents' house. The rules have changed. Like the no TV, the no this, the like you know, that I grew up with, they're, they're gone now as grandparents. But like we had, we had structure and discipline and rules, yet there was always love. And I think that's what a lot of kids miss nowadays. It's like either they they come from this, you know, they come from a background of like permissive where they're allowed to do whatever they want, or they come from this world of like, hey, a lot of discipline, but not a lot of love behind it. And the greatest gift I think we can give young people is like that we love you so much that we're going to hold you accountable, but there's nothing you can ever do to make me not love you. Like that's, and that's how I grew up. And that's how I felt. Now, I certainly went through my phases and yeah. I certainly went through my times. And there was a time when we moved away from New York City and moved to Pennsylvania and there's a lot of factors in it, but I know I certainly was one of them. And I certainly was me starting to go down this path of, you know, just, I, I, I love graffiti and I, you know, it's one thing to love graffiti and I mean, love doing graffiti. I love, I love. You gotta tell me this, <laughs> like graffiti? I'm just starting to get involved in like things that like, you know, like that, that in, in, in the end would not be me, right? And so in those formative years and, and um, so, we, you know, and a lot, like I said, a lot of things in our family led my dad to move to Pennsylvania. But when I talk about my father, my, my father picked our family up, like, we lived in New York City. My dad was on self-support as a minister. Then eventually took a job teaching while he also would run the midnight basketball centers like down in the toughest neighborhoods. And so like we grew up in kind of a blue collar area. My, my dad taught at one of the nicest private schools, which been, then I couldn't then go to one of the nicest private schools. But then at night he would be running, you know, 
basketball down in Hell's Kitchen or all these before it was Disneyland, you know, coming kind of some tough places. And I got to be around people. And I think the thing for me, Damon, is like people are people. Like people talk a lot about coaches and players and this and that. People are people and just see people for who they are as people. And it changes your perspective. Like, like some of the people, they see me and they see the, the Huskers coach, but I'm just Matt. Like I'm just a person. Like, like, so I think I learned all these kind of lessons from him. I, like I said, I, I never saw him angry. I never saw him. Um, but at the same time, like he was a tough coach and, and hopefully, you know, when you hear me talk, you've heard me talk many times, I talk about like, Hey, we have a mission to be great and win championships and all that. But we also have a purpose of having people's lives. Like, like my parents just got back from three months in, in Rwanda, you know, uh, working in orphans there because that's what they do every year. And, and so like giving is the highest form of living. Uh, my dad chose to do it as a minister. My mom chose to do it as a crisis, crisis worker and with women. Um, I choose to do it as a football coach and in all the ways that we do it, um, if we're giving to other people, then I think we're living a purpose filled life. And so the, all those things kind of hit me. And it's like, when people ask me like, why did you get into coach? Why would you coach when you could have taken a year off? It was because I don't coach to coach. I coach to like be around these, these, these young men. Right. And so I had been away from them for a couple of years and I was ready to get back to them. And so that all comes full circle to me, but I couldn't have been more blessed in the way that I was raised. Um, you know, it's, it was pretty special. So you're describing what we kind of see as your personality. At least I do, because I'm around you a fair amount, or at least talking. You have this firm side that is pretty no-nonsense, right? Hey, get to practice. Don't know this in enough at that time. Hey, we're, we're going to be visible and functional in class, right? They're non-negotiables. But then there's this, you know, I've given player X at this stop six opportunities. And you have kind of a a general rule. As long as they're appreciative and don't take you for granted, then you're willing to go the extra opportunity, right? If you're grateful, like, if you're grateful for the opportunity, if if a kid makes a mistake as like, coach, I am so sorry, and they mean it, then like, yeah, no, there's some non-negotiables. I'm not going to be involved with people that hurt people that are weaker than them, right? Like, I'm not talking about like, you know, two guys get into a fight. There's discipline. I'm talking about when you're, hurting people you know I'm, I'm not dealing with guys involved in like gender violence and sexual assault and all those things so i'm sending those over there but you know um i i i understand that people make mistakes and to me um if you're if you make a mistake and, you, and you're apologetic and you and you're a grateful person and you want to like like what would the world be if we all just got one shot you know what i mean like um i i, I by the grace of god i sit where i am today and the, the amount of stupid things i've done in my life i mean there weren't, I mean, I don't know, you're younger than me. There weren't cell phones around when I was in college. I'm just a couple years older. Are you, you look so young, though, compared to me. My goodness. Prune juice. <laughs> so, but, <laughs> I'm totally kidding. But I am older. Like, I'm, I'm 49. Are you really? Yeah. So we're close. I need to get myself together. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> Any, <laughs> antioxidants, <laughs> you know. So I'm listening, and there's so many, growing up in an educational household, I, believe it or not, I'm, I'm the, I'm probably the dumbest one in the family. So you have these mannerisms and these kind of ideologies that are very teacher educational based, right? Meeting people right where they're at, the kind of the blank slate phenomenon where no preconceived notions, right? So where'd that come from, right? Because your bottom line is people are people, but it's deeper than that because you have to be willing to put your accomplishments, whatever your title is, all of that momentarily goes away when you say, I'm just Matt. Yeah. I would be afraid to call you by your first name, right? But that's really, it seems like that's your strength, right? Is the ability to, to, to go back and forth between leadership and knowing that there's hierarchy, but listen, I'm for you. Let's do this together. Yeah, well, I mean, I think, you know, my role is my role, right? So, like, I'm the head football coach. So, when it's time to be the head football coach, I have to be the head, like, like Marcus Satterfield is one of my great friends. Evan Cooper is one of my great friends. Well, I, I got to be the head coach. Um, I got to run things. I have to make sure things are going well. Um, at the same time, I have so much trust in them that I have to have the humility to also trust them and listen. Um, so, I, I think those things, I think, I think that part of it is, like, being really strong. I, you know, like, I look at it like this. My job is to make sure that everyone that works for me what plays for me has everything they need to be successful. Like, hey, you know, I need, I need a, I need a six foot six defensive end. Hey, I, I you know, I need 
a, a great nutrition plan. Like making sure I get everything for everyone. And then on the flip side, once they have what they need, making sure everybody's doing exactly what they're supposed to do. And so um, that's, a, that's a tough process, man. That's a process of like holding people highly accountable every day, holding yourself highly accountable every day, having people within the organization who will call, you know, who call BS on you and say, no, that's wrong. Like, you know, Sean Pad's been a long time because, you know, he's truth to power. Like he's going to tell me like, hey, this is dumb. This is wrong. Evan Cooper, you know, he might, he played for me, so he might do it in kind of in a different type of a way, but, you know, he's going to tell me I'm wrong. And so I have enough people here that are going to tell me I'm wrong or tell me to disagree. And I think that, that, like that Italian part of me that loves to argue, that loves to question things, loves this process of us sitting around always and being like, how can we do it better? How can we do it better? Um, so I, I, I can be strong, but at the same time, I, I trust people that are here. They're going to hold me accountable. And I think when the players see that, I think when the players see that, like, none of us ha- are in our own feelings, like coaches are usually worse than the players in terms yeah. of the egos. Um, I think that goes a long way. And then when you talk about learning, I mean, like, I, you know, I was an educational psychology major. Um, I, I, I believe wholeheartedly in the, in the principles of, of learning and of motivation. You know, I wrote my thesis on expert novice differences. I actually did it in football play recognition, like to t- take in that world of bringing it over here. And so, mm. you know, I, I believe that everyone can learn, you know, I'm, I'm my wife and I, you know, my wife started a 5013C here called reading rules for, to help kids with reading because dyslexia has affected our family. And so I, I'm someone who, I'm someone who reads a book a week. Like I, yeah. I love to read and I have, I have a child who hates to read because of how hard it is. And so, when you go through that and you have a child that has something, right? Um, you don't want, you, you don't want people that are operating from like a deficit model where they're like, oh, well you can't. Get another do educational term. Yeah. So like, I want someone who's looking at my kid, like, well, he can do this and he can do this. Like, yeah, find my flaws. Great. Like, and, and that's like, I have one rule for the staff. And if you ask them like, what's this rule about players? Like if we have an evaluation meeting, no, that's fine. But other than that, don't tell me what a player can do. They tell me what he, tell me maybe what he's refusing to do. Tell me what he's not working at, but don't tell me how well, someone's you know, coaches are notorious. Oh, he can't do this. He can't do that. And that's why, you know, you won't ever hear me do that in, in, in the media. You won't ever hear me because I don't need someone coaching my kids that doesn't believe in my kids. So I'm not going to coach your kids and not believe in your kids. Now, I can put them in the best positions and I can know his strengths and weaknesses, but I'm never going to, I'm never going to blame them for the result. And so all these things kind of all tie in. If you think about it, like this concept of fame, yeah, the concept of like, kind of ties into brotherhood and this concept of like learning and education, finding what's right in people. Um, it all kind of, and, and, and what you hope happens is um, it builds a psychologically safe place where like, like I'll tell people like we are a caring. We talked about Maslow before, yeah, right? Yeah. <laughs> the, the hierarchy. And, and, and I've, I've be, since begun to study it because it's like, yeah, I've, I've heard it, but like, I think that's really, really important. And, and to your point, like you can't begin to excel until you feel safety till you feel like, Hey, I'm free to make mistakes. And this generation is like when you and I played, you you made a bad play. You had to worry about seeing it and film the next day. Now, if you play now, like you got to worry about like getting on the bus and you're a mean. So it's like, I want to build a place, at least within these walls that is psychologically safe. Yet at the same time, I tell our guys, this is a caring, but not coddling environment. One of the greatest lines you've uttered since I stole it from somebody. So I, (laughs) I stole it from, I stole it from Ron Carson, who, who's a, who's a, who's a graduate of UNL and has been a donor to the, you know, and so we were talking one day, he was talking about his business and he said, Hey, we're a caring, not calling environment. He said, we, um, we're a place where high achievers come to be around high Other achievers. High achievers. And I was like, Duh. I said to him, actually, I said, I'm going to steal that. He said, go ahead. I, I said, so I'm, you followed it up with the lion reference, right? <laughs> so <laughs> see, I, like, I listen. Yeah. And so, but th- that's, that's it. Like if you break yourself into that, like, Hey, like I am a lion, I'm not a sheep. And then I, you know, obviously I referenced the, the book, but like, I have to say that self to my own, to, I have to say that to myself all the time. Like, like you're not going to be a lion every day. Like there's gonna be times where you're sheep. And so the thing that I've tried to, I've tried to like, like I've talked to like Tommy Hill, I'll be like, Hey, watch me in the waiting room sometime. Like if I don't, if I don't, if I'm doing something in the waiting room and I don't get what I'm supposed to get, like I will say the worst things to myself and like things you're probably not supposed to, you know, positive self-talk and all that. Well, I believe in that in the inner dialogue, but exteriorly, man, I'm like, I'm like, you're soft, you're a sheep. Because it's like, it's a choice. Like, I want to make the choice to be here. And so many of us, we live our lives where, man, we're like, we're like letting David Goggins and Jocko Willink and all these guys on Instagram motivate us. Um, but are we actually going out and doing what they're doing? Like, to me, I'm not going to go run 100 miles. So that's just, you know, you might not believe that, but it's true. 
So, but in my own way, what are the things that I need to do to be a lion? What are the things my players need to do to be lions? And then calling ourselves out when we're sheep. So, um, so kind of along that line, just to, to stay with it, there's this balance of like this meekness and kind of humility with the ability to step on the gas. What, where did the competitiveness come from, right? You're, you constantly have this ability to kind of clap back. You've got a response. You, like you, you, it seems like your hands are always up. That is what that that is. I mean, that is true. Like you look, that is what meekness means. Like sometimes we think it's it's weak, but like, like I you know I talk about about humble confidence. Like, like you have to be humble enough to prepare and confident enough to perform. And so, like, like either you're a competitor or you're not. Like, mm. you know, I I talk about us being the toughest, hardest working, most competitive team in the country. Like, I can't say we're going to be the fastest or the biggest or the, um, we're not going to be the most well coached or the smartest. I can't say those things. But we can be tough. Like we can have the mental and physical strength to do what we're supposed to do at all times. We we can work hard. We can do a little bit extra, and we can compete. We can try to we can try to win everything we do, and we can also at the same time never come in second to ourselves. So, like that competitive model. Like I go play golf. I hate golf. I absolutely hate it. I'm hitting an eight. I'm hitting an eight. I'm putting it in the water. I'm hitting an eight. All of a sudden he's like, all right, let's play for something. All of a sudden now I'm bogey. I'm par. Like like I don't like to exercise. I can't stand it. All of a sudden, they're like, "Hey, let's go play pickleball this morning at six a.m." I'm there. Like, I like, I like competition. I like community. I like being around people. Like, people will say, like, oh, "Coach, I saw you out at the farmers market." What are you doing at the farmers market? I like community. I like, coach. You know, I saw you at the the tavern. I saw you at the restaurant. I like community. I like being around people. I don't like sitting in my house by myself. I like competition. I don't like, you know, I don't like to go for a run. But I, I once ran a marathon because someone dared me to, and it was a challenge. So. That's just the way I'm wired. I know my strengths. I also know my weaknesses. So I try to play to my strengths and then work on my weaknesses. Rank these for me um, as I kind of hear you talk about attributes of a coach. Culture, right? Um, where that, what, whatever it is. Having a strong spouse. And then making sure that you don't want something more than your players. I would say culture first because culture has to do with the players. And my definition of culture, it's a very used, whatever we say we are, you know, like, like there's an old quote, like, uh, you know, I can't, I'm going to say it wrong now. What you say you are is your philosophy. You know, what you do is your identity. Like mm-hmm. to me, culture is all the standards that we say we have, all the relationships that we say we want to build, the brotherhood, all, all the behaviors that we say that, hey, we're going to hold ourselves to. That's, that's our philosophy, right? So then what level of that are we at and what percentage of the team is at that? That's truly our culture. So if we say we do this, but we have functioning to, part of it. Right. So, but and if they're mere, like, I'm, I just want integrity. Like if we say like, you know what, we're here just to party and have fun and we party and have fun. At least I can say you are what you say you are. Yeah. But what I can't live in is a world that says, Hey, I'm here to be the best and da, 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 da. And then you work three hours a day. Like I can't live in that world. So to me, like, I just want you to, I want integrity. I want who you say you are to match who you are. And when you have that, you have good culture, provided these are the right things. So, right. you know, we say we want to be tough, then we better be tough. We say we want to work hard, we better work hard. We say we want to be competitive. And it's one thing for me, but do, do my actions match Corey Campbell's actions, match Susan Ells' actions, and then do they match uh, Nash Hutchmacher and those guys? So that to me is the, that's culture. And so, that's the functioning, living, breathing part of this. And so, like, I'll have people say to me sometimes, like, oh, I don't know, I'm starting to drink the roulade, and I don't know, you know, we're winning the offseason again. And, I, and people have heard me say this, I think, at the Chamber, maybe if they listen to that, but I'm like, exactly, right? Like, like how are we teaching these kids to, how, to win in the fall if we're not trying to win right now? It's just we're not trying to win right now with a camera. We're trying to win right now with our actions. The cameras just sometimes catch what we're doing. Yeah. And then... I, if you ever notice the highlight videos we put out, it's never of a player talking. Like I, like I showed them the highlight video that we had made. Oh, that's season. interesting now that you say it. Well, the highlight video we made, we made it's not about the previous staff. The guys here made it from last season, and it was like 12 speeches in the locker room. I was like, hey, guys, like like Christian McCaffrey used to say this to me. You know, why don't we just play loud? Like, play loud. Play loud. Don't talk loud. Play loud. So trying to get all those things done where, where that type of organization, like, that would be first. Um you put spouse in there, and if I don't rank that high, I'm going to get in trouble. So I'm going to go ahead and put... Well, I, I've seen a lot of people's careers... She, like bending, she likes bending, right? She's so a, I like... That's what I'm saying. But like, like, she, like, t- the thing for me about Julie is um, 
she bridges things. Like she did the tackle your son event. Yeah. She the next day they did a community service event because she believes in community, and so she wants to build a community of the women of Nebraska football, the moms, the grandmoms, the aunts. Like she wants, she understands those relationships, and so you know, I I I I talk a lot about resilience and like you know when you were in school and I was in school when we were all growing up, you know you had your you maybe you had the Boys and Girls Club, maybe you had church, maybe you had your friends, maybe you had the neighborhood, maybe you had the Y, maybe you had, you, you had all these things, right? Then you got to college, you had your dorm floor, you had your classes. Now we live in a world where a lot of education's online. Uh, guys kind of move off and live in their own separate places. Um, COVID, their phones have robbed them of all these connections. Most of their connections are really in, they're in a, an iPhone, right? And so there, when things go wrong, there's not a bunch of people that are like, latching on to you and so we've tried to bring everyone back into the building mm. and that culture of being here and having connections academically having connections in the community having connections with each other having connections not be with my two or three partners but like hey who are the guys on this team that i don't know that i can get to know we eat together we invite guys to bring their girlfriends their parents to eat with us things that you never thought about maybe before covid we do now differently and that all leads to the culture and julie to me is a huge part of that culture because she She's there in the recruiting process. She's there when they're here. She's not, I mean, I met some coaches' wives. There are some high maintenance, you know, like Julie's in it now. She's yeah. absolutely in it. And then uh, the, the third thing I said to your players wanting it more than you, you do. I, I truly believe that these kids all want, like these kids here, they want that they, sort itself out. Well, yeah. And you know what? Um, I think you just got to talk to them sometimes. Sometimes they're just so afraid to say like, I'm scared to death that this isn't going to work out. You have to put your all into this, knowing it might not work out. And it's easy when you're a walk-on because the odds are against you. So you're, it's probably not going to work out. So just being on the team, like I was a walk-on, like getting on the field was enough for me. But when you come, you come from um, somewhere and you have high expectations placed on you, whether I saw it when the, I drafted guys in the first round in the NFL, like when, when you have high, high expectations, every single day you're like, you know, am I, am I, am I making it happen? Like you're looking for the end product. And I'm always like, guys, you know, they're, they're building this, they're building this project over here. They're building the engineering school. They didn't lay like three bricks and look back and be like, how's the building look? Like they just kept laying bricks until finally they had a wall and then they had four walls and then they had, like just like, but it's easy for me because I've been doing this for so long. When I look at a young player, I can see what I think they'll be. That young player can usually see like what's right in front of them. So this time's maybe a little easier for me because I have a little bit more runway where People are like, hey, he won at Temple. He won at Baylor. At least he coached in the NFL. Like, maybe I'll listen to him. Um, that's why, guys, maybe he'll change positions. Because I'll say, hey, listen, I'm not, I'm not sure if I'm right, but I think you could be really good at this. But so many times we think, this kid doesn't want it. This kid doesn't care. This kid, you know what? We should just shut up and ask the kid, like, hey, tell me what's going on in your life. I used to be the coach. Like, kid walked in, he had made a mistake. I'd be like, don't you ever. Now I'm like, explain it to me. Because sometimes there's so many things happen that I don't even know, and we'll still hold them accountable. We'll still have discipline, but at least you know what you're dealing with. Like, because kids want to be heard. I like to be heard. You like to be heard. We all like to be heard. So certainly they, after living in their own houses in high school for two years or a year and a half, depending where you're coming from, they probably want to be heard and seen and, and noticed and taken seriously. So that that's the change from like Matt Wool at Temple to Matt Wool now. Um, we got like Coop and them will tell me I'm softer now, and maybe I am, but both it's smarter too. Mm. You want to head outside? Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. We're we're out here. This is the field where the magic happens. We've kind of we we figured out that the process, what you enjoy doing, why you do it. Now it's about the kids out here. Well, just got finished with winter conditioning, then spring ball. How'd you put it on a grading curve? Uh, you know, we we asked the guys just now. We we asked them to just to get one percent better. Um, I, I think we're ahead of where I thought we would be, which is good. Um, they are really, really eager and willing to do what we ask. None of that, you know, none of that means that I we're going to win this game or that game. You know, I mean, we have a lot of work still to do. But I thought, I thought they worked really hard, and I, I was pleased with the spring game. Um, you know, we had, you know, we put the ball on the ground. Some, I mean, it wasn't the best football, but to play that long, like most people won't play that many snaps in a spring game, and to play that long and to play special teams and to get guys out there and subs out there, and, and most importantly for me was. Like th- when you come out here on this field, this should be a celebration of our culture, a celebration of brotherhood, a celebration of like, hey, I'm going to go compete at the highest levels. And it should, but it shouldn't be a show, man. Right? Like we don't want to be show ponies, man. We want to be workhorses. 
And so I was proud of the fact that it wasn't like we didn't all of a sudden make it all about the fact that there was a crowd here. I wanted I wanted that game to look just like the previous Saturday when there was like 200 people here. And I think when you have that kind of team, you know, you can play on the road, you can play at home, you can play in good weather, bad weather. So those little things I was looking for, um, I thought we I thought we made progress in. So when you first started, I thought it was interesting. You said you just watched guys' movements for a, a while before you started putting weight on their backs and things of that nature. Some of the things that we think like, oh, yeah, that makes sense, but we don't really see the practical application of. Were you taken aback that the guys were like, wait a minute, what are we doing? You're just watching us walk. You're watching us run. You're watching us do high knees. Like, you basically started at the beginning. You know, I think uh, one of the things I've learned over the last couple of years is is a lot of, a lot about movement quality. I think my time at Baylor was really important for me because that that's a track school. You know, that's that's Michael Johnson. That's that's those people. So we had access to to, to things I had never had access before. And so, um, you know, when I came in here, you know, you, you sit there. Everyone wants to make like, hey, it hasn't really worked. They want to make it real simple. What's this person's fault? It's that it's never that. We die of a thousand paper cuts, man. Like. Well, Al Gold and I used to work for, he would call it death by inches. So, you know, one of the things I looked at was injury history, you know, and, and there had been a ton of knee injuries. And so um, I look at everything. I look at the surface, right? I look at the practice surface. I look at the cleats. I look at the measuring the right feet. Are guys wearing the right shoes or, you know, knee braces? No knee. So you look at everything, right? And then you try to make the best decisions. A big part of that is movement quality. And so we started just from ground zero. Like, hey, this is how you do a high knee. <laughs> This is how you decel. You know, you work on decelerations. And and talking earlier about my growth, like, you know, why do we do decelerations? You're not just doing them because coach asked you to do them. They help prevent ACL tears, right? So we do this thing that seems stupid, but this is the why and making sure we explain the why. So Corey Campbell does a great job. I and Mitch does a great job. And, uh, you know, I'm lucky in the weight room that those guys explain those things. But just, yeah, you're right. We started here. But I think by the end of the semester, um, by the end of the playing. And then we did a pro day afterwards for the guys that were healthy. Um, a lot of guys that move well. And so that'll only just get better and better as, as it becomes more ingrained into our culture. So it's interesting. You, I kind of took this, this was a summation of you were talking about, uh, you know, this isn't Disneyland and, and caring, not cod or caring, not coddling in terms of your culture. So you have this weird dynamic when you're talking about where you are with development based on, let's say, Baylor or Temple, you, you said, ah, this kind of feels more like year two than year one. And internally, I was like, he's setting the expectation, right? But the interesting thing is you want people to understand you haven't won, so you haven't earned the right to win because this is Nebraska, you haven't won. But you are at Nebraska, so we should be winning. Right, like you have to understand those two things at once. Mm-hmm. Nothing's promised because it's Nebraska, but because this is Nebraska, this is what we expect. What was that teaching process like? Uh, I think it's <laughs> it's not easy. It's hard because it has to make has to make sense to yourself. I just think like there's a humility to like, man, we're four and eight, and like, we're four and eight. Like, and you're four and eight until you play next year. And the one thing I've done with the guys, just so you know, is like well, I've tried to teach things off of last year's tape. I tell them all the time, set the ground rules. I coached, I was the head coach here at Nebraska last year. Every player you might have transferred in, you played here. So when we talk about last year, we're talking about us, right? Because we're trying to evolve and grow. So we are four and eight. Um, and when you're four and eight, you, sh- you, sh- you should, as, as Ray Lewis would say, you should be pissed off for greatness, right? Like we should be angry and we should have a chip on our shoulder. Um, not have a chip on our shoulder because, you know, of, of the national championships up there and being four and eight, just... We're not here, like we're, we're not, we're, we're lions, we're not sheep. We don't, we're not the slaughterhouse of failures on our destiny. Like we're supposed to win because, because we do it. So I think that's part of it is just, hey, we better have this humility, but because we work so hard and because we're willing to do hard things, we should have confidence. And so we should work our way to get to the season where we have a chance to expect to win. But we can't just do it because it's our birthright. That, that Again, that goes back to, like, that makes us show ponies. That makes it a show. It makes it about everything else other than just the football. We have to get our football so good, whether that's our movement, our strength, our tactics, our techniques. We have to get that so good that we expect to win. And so it's a process. I, I think for me, um, saying, hey, it feels like you're two at those places 
was more of an homage to our players and how hard that they worked and what they did. I thought what I thought what Mickey Joseph, I thought what the staff did, I thought what Phil Bush did, I thought what you know all those guys did last year. I thought what the players did to hang in there all year. That's that needs to be recognized. That, that a lot of teams would have quit. The players they they hung in there. So I wanted them to understand that I don't think we have to go two and ten. But just saying that doesn't mean we won't go two and ten. We've got to work and. um that's the thing that, you know, again, going back to the whole the whole rule aid comment, the whole win the offseason. It Damon, it says it on the stadium day by day. Like that is embedded into the culture of this place. Day by day. So I won't when people say how many games are we doing next year, I'm worried about today because it's part of the ethos of Nebraska. Like, are we gonna do this? Are we gonna do that? People are so excited for the season. Day by day. And you know what? We might win a game, we might lose a game, and no matter what happens, I'm going to get up the next day and I'm going to try to get 1% better than I was the day before. That's culture. That's Tom Osborne. That's Frank Solich. That's, I mean, Coach, Sol- Coach Osborne comes in and talks to us about his game goals. You know, Ron Brown tells us that we beat UCLA, number two team in the country, but we had a couple of interceptions. The coach acted like we lost because it wasn't to our standard. And that's championship culture. And so, I say all that to say, I don't think about it in terms of setting expectations. I, I, I think of it more for myself as, hey, I want you guys to know I believe that if you work hard, you'll have a chance to win games this year. Now you're going to have to go do it. You're going to have to get to the fourth quarter with a lead in hand and put people away. You're going to have to get to the fourth quarter behind and make a comeback. You're going to have to play when your best player maybe gets hurt. You have to play when all the breaks are going against you. You're going to have to earn that. Um, but we earn it day by day there is no rule aid there is no cool aid there is no i'm believing again it's just about working today right like that's what we all do that's what the farmers in the state of nebraska do they 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 don't worry about the harvest they worry about that day knowing that if they do that day then the harvest will come that's what the people building these buildings on campus do they work today knowing that it will result in something we will we will win at the highest level again when that is i don't know because i'm only worried about today how do you get folks to understand that the past is someplace they don't want to be again, but not be married or locked into it when it comes to records three and nine or four and eight, right? Where you you understand that it's not a birthright, but you don't want to be held captive by it either, right? It can't be the paralysis by now. Well, you know, so, so you, when you talk about the past, it's like there's the distinguished elite past, right? And so to me, what does that say? That, that means it can be done, right? That means it can be done. So we're not trying to get us to somewhere we've never been. We're trying to get us back to somewhere we have been. So it can be done. So that's that's a fact. Now, when you look at like recent history and hey, we're not we're not winning, we're not going to bowl games, it makes you say to yourself, then hey, what we're doing might not be right. Again, it's it's easy to just sit there and blame it on one thing, one person, one it's it's never that, right? So I think it's Trev, it's it's President Carter, it's Matt Wool, it's the assistant coaches, it's the players, it's the fan base is everybody, all of us looking and saying, hey, what can we do? Like, what can we do today that will lead back to greatness? And to your point, like, um, I, I can't be held accountable for what someone did before me. Our players can't be held accountable for what someone did before them. Like, I, I just prefer to live in the now. Like, we want to, again, we want to learn from the past. We want to prepare for the future, but we've got to live in the now. And um, I understand people, maybe they're frustrated, but you know what? They'll, they'll be happy again. Like, they'll be happy again. Um, and... When we get to there, you know what we're going to be talking about? Today. Because <laughs> we don't want to get complacent. You know, we don't want to sit there and expect because we're winning, we're going to continue to win. The worst thing that happens, that's why teams that start to win, like you win a couple games and then they lose, is you try to recapture winning. So you say to yourself, like, well, what do we do to win? And then you wear the same clothes or you, hey, well, you know, let's let's play this in the same formation. That's not what winning is. Winning is, hey, what are the resources we have? You know, what are the defects the other team has? How do we take advantage of what they don't have? utilize what we have, protect what we struggle with. Like it's always being strategic and forward thinking. And that's, we did that round table with coach Osborne and that's what I tried to hit on there. It's not about me going back and trying to do everything we did in the nineties. Coach was in the nineties and he was on the cutting edge. So to best represent what Nebraska means, it's how can we be on the cutting edge now so that everyone in the country after we win is coming in and saying, Hey, tell me what you guys are doing. Tell me what you guys are doing. that's different than what we're doing. So if that's, if it's, tactical and then technical the players have the technical stuff and the staff is responsible for the tactic i think it's shared like you know so obviously the coaches i mean but really the coaches they set the techniques 
and they set sort of, here's our tactics. Like, you know, we have an overall strategy, but the tactics to achieve that strategy can change every week. So we set the tactics, but even within playing football, there's the technique, you know, hey, you, you backpedal this way, you get in a stance this way, but a lot of football is tactical. It's like, you know, hey, um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm backpedaling off one, I'm reading two, two breaks out, what do I do? And it's the guys who can think quickly that respond. And that's one of the great things about Coach Osborne, you know, and Coach Solich, Coach Devaney, and the way they practiced where everyone was moving and there was four stations. You got so many reps. You didn't just develop your technique. You developed your tactics. You saw things time and time again. So for me, I wrote my, I wrote my, my thesis. Again, we talked earlier about off Erickson, off of expert novice differences, off the you know, sort of the 10,000 hour, hour rule of Eric, you know, I have Erickson and 10 years to be an expert. So it's like the more reps I get, the quicker I see things. I, I'm not a big believer in instincts. And people say this kid's got great instincts. So, um, I think it's cognitive. I think it's reps. I think it's visual. <laughs> and don't get me started because the coaches, I recognize when someone has it, but I think it can be developed through reps and through seeing things, which is why to me, talking very fast, the New Yorker is coming out right now, which is why to, which, which is why to me, um, practice is the most important thing in our organization. Because if you don't practice well, you don't, you can't tactically respond right in situations. Coaches can meet all day and tell you things, but you're the one out there playing. Hey, Jeff Sims, the ball's in your hands. Like, you got to win versus man-to-man. Hey, you got to pick up that blitz. You got to see the safety come and go pick up that blitz. And so we'll train you technically. We'll train you tactically. And then you got to go play the game. And that's the benefit of that is it's freeing. Like, uh, we're, what we're going to do is we're going to train these guys. And, man, I'll tell you what, we're going to cut them loose on game day. And if it works out great, if it doesn't work out, we'll train them again and cut them loose the next week. But we're going to attack. We're not going to sit back and hope to win. Uh, you, to portal or not to portal, that's kind of been the question with colleges around the country. You, you go and get your quarterback, and you've had some key additions. Maybe not as aggressive as some maybe would have thought. Going in, you've kind of, you, you're into developing your guys. But let's start at at the quarterback spot. Obviously, the depth is took a little bit of a hit, but some of that is to be expected. You know how the game goes with quarterbacks around the country. What? How have you changed to kind of evolve into how the, the, the game is dictated? Yeah, you know, I'm going to do what I think is right for the team, but also right for each individual. I'm going to always follow the rules, but I'm also going to try to make sure what I do is 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 filled with integrity and not worry about how people see it. You know, I, I always want to be someone that history, when you look back, you say, okay, hey, he did the right thing. Not in the moment. Because sometimes you can do things that you know are right. And I learned this at Baylor when I took over after a scandal. Like everyone was always worried about the optics, the optics, the optics. I was like, let history, let's worry about history optics. When people look back, do they say, you know what, they did the right things in that situation? So for me, I kind of look at it like that. Like we came in and we had a chance to get some guys out of the portal. And I wanted to get guys in like that sophomore and junior class. And you know, there were some unique ties to some of those guys. So I, I had information. Um, so I think there's always going to be a place for that. But I, but I do know this, Damon. Like, I got a lot of parents right now asking me, like, hey, how many guys are you going to take in the portal? Because they don't want to send their kids somewhere that they're going to be there for two or three years, and then they're going to bring someone in ahead, especially now in the NIL era. Like, you know, hey, they're going to bring this kid in, and he's, he, you know, he's marketable, so he's going to play more than my kid. So we still want to keep our ethos of, like, hey, we are a developmental program. Um, we'll always look at the portal. We'll always look at guys. Um, but you know what? Like, I, I want to know why you left. You know, I mean, I don't, I don't, you know, we think playing at the University of Nebraska is, is the highest of the high. We think playing here, like, means you can play anywhere. And so you know, we want to do our due diligence, take each, each one kind of at, for what it is. So it, it's a, it's a challenge. I've had to adapt to new things. It's also given us a lot of abilities with our own guys. We had a lot of guys that really wanted to be here and they also really wanted to play a lot. And unfortunately, like, you know, maybe being here means you're not going to play as much and going somewhere else means you're going to play more. And so being honest with guys was, I think was really important to me. And, um, you know, we, we, we want to build a program where guys don't want to transfer. I think most guys didn't. Um, but you know what guys had to do what was right for them in, or, in order to get on the field. But I think the key part of our team that's here, um, stayed. I get the sense, um, just kind of how you want to play on offense, at least what we've heard out loud in this weird way is trying to predicate on being able to play good defense, right? If you're going to, you're going to have ball control offense, you know, run action, run the football that usually is complemented by a strong defense. If you're not going to try to outscore people, how important is, or which do you think you can develop first an identity offensively or defense? 
It's a great question. I, you know, I, I expect us to identify. I expect us to build both identities. Um, I just think, you know, you can't find me now. I'll take out Alabama and Georgia because they're so much further ahead than everybody in the last couple of years. But you can't find many places to me that that playing it around the yard all the time and play in tempo and do all those things that also have great defenses because, you know, just in relation to the type of offense, like if you're trying to run 85 plays, your defense is going to play 10 more snaps. And so there's not many teams that, that have been able to be like elite doing that, but also have a great defense. Um, so that's, that struggles because I, I don't know how you can win a national championship if you can't play great defense. Um, you talk about Nebraska's history, you know, yeah, everyone always hits me like, move the ball, use a fullback. No one ever says like, well, let's get back to those defenses. Like, go back to, go back, go back to like, the, and I hope it's okay that I say this. I'm just might offend former players. I don't, I don't mean it. I mean it in the greatest of respect. It's not about the shirt. <laughs> the black shirts, was, to me, was the way you played football. It meant you got to wear that shirt. Like, people say, you bring, I, I think I showed you one day, like, go, go look at a Baylor practice. Every guy, the starting defense yeah, had black shirts on. Go look at it. Because because I grew up in this era, I I coached my first year of college football in 1998. You can bet Jeff Collins, the defensive coordinator at Albright College, future Georgia Tech head coach, you can bet the defense was wearing black shirts. I don't. So like that was hey, we believe in defense, and so um, I don't know how you can win at the highest levels if you can't play great defense. So I'll start there. So I expect us to be explosive on offense. Like you guys were a ball control, run the ball team, yes, and I think you guys scored 70, 60, 70 points. Yeah. So I mean. I don't think that means that we're just going to like go three yards in a cloud of dust. Like we're going to be explosive. We're going to run the quarterback. We're going to throw RPOs. We're going to break in and out of tempo and no. Te- but at the end of the day, when we have a lead in the fourth quarter and you need to get ten yards, and the def- defense knows we're running it and we know we're running it, we'll be our our, fu- our fate will be determined by can we get ten yards. Um, when it's good teams or early on, like we'll, our our fate will be determined this year based upon. It's third and one. Can we run it and get a? It's fourth and one. Can we run it and get a yard? Like that to me is what matters. And so, if we can play great defense. If we can play great offense, and if we can complement that with special teams, then then we'll give ourselves a chance at every game. And even further than that, if I may say this, like, and at, at, at Temple, people have made a lot about oh, you're three three five. Are you that? At Temple, we were an I formation offense, and we ran power and counter. You know what? We'd get in the gun and we'd sling it. But we, you, you knew when you played us, we were four-down defense. Went to Baylor. I had NFL receivers. I had three NFL tailbacks. We were an 11 personnel, spread out, no huddle. Um, but you know what? We we went to the three-down, three-three stack on defense. We were top five in the nation in defense. I'd go to the NFL. I could never get the offense turned in the NFL. But on defense, we were number two in the league in the second year with kind of a double hybrid, you know, five down. So it's not the what that you do to me. It's how you do it. And um, so I say all that to say we're going to have an identity on defense and we're going to run the ball and play hard and be physical and knock the ball out. Um, that's Now, can we get there? Um, we'll see. On offense, we're going to run the football. We're going to try to create explosives. We're going to be really good situationally. And our quarterbacks, we think, have a chance to be difference makers. And on special teams, we, we, we want to block kicks. We're going to return. We're not going to fair catch kickoff returns. It's interesting how you've talked about that for a while now. Right. You want your hands on balls with defensive kicking, with not a lot of people come in saying you don't get after them. Where'd that come from? Well, so we started doing it at, at Temple. Ed, Ed was the special teams coordinator at Temple. Mike Sarabo was the special teams coordinator. And we just started blocking them, and it caught fire. And it would, like, it would change games. And, like, our guys took such pride in it. Like, like got, starters wanted to be on special teams because you're not just going out there to run a play. You're going out there to make a play. Like, like let me go make a play. Like, I'll give you an example. I started getting caught up into the whole world of like, oh, it's fair catch kickoff returns, okay? My last year in college. And Ed came back and he was like, dude, like, are you going to play football or not? And I was like, well, here's why. And he was like, there's going to be a game. I can't promise everyone will be a good one, but there's going to be a game where you can take a kickoff return and we take it back. We're playing Texas Tech. We're not playing very good. We're like number 15 in the country. We're at the 7-0, and whatever the year was, 6-0. And the opening kickoff of the second half, they kick it to Josh Fleeks. He's about a yard deep. He takes it back 72 yards. We're off and running. And I was like, I get it. Then we get to the NFL, and I'm like, well, let's put our fleet on the goal line. I hired this guy, Chris Daber, who had who had, had Correll Patterson, who was one of the great kickoff return coaches in the NFL. And he was like, hey, Matt, are we, are, are we, are we going to play football? Like, like, let's not worry about, like, field position being perfect. Let, let's have them kick it off to us. 
let's make them run down and have to tackle us. And let's go block. And so I guess me, this fourth version of me, I want to play football. I want people to come here and be like, we might win, we might lose, but either way, they're going to feel us. And so I don't want there to be any plays off. I don't want there to be like, uh, you know, hey, we're going to fair catch a kickoff or turner. Oh, we're going to make it easy. No, we're not going to block every kick and we're going to be smart, but we're going to challenge people. And because we want to make plays and we know that because we're four and eight, we have to find every single edge to give ourselves an edge in winning the game. Interesting. You you get credit because you've rebuilt some programs. And I think people want that here. It started with you calling this a developmental program, right? You spoke it into existence. You got to develop guys. So we got that down. But were there any downsides to having done this at so many places when you got here? Because sometimes, you know, the repetitiveness can, can, well, I got this. We've done it before. We've done it before. Or is it, as a kind of a lifelong learner, you found ways to tweak it, take what you know has worked, because with some of the familiarity of your staff, you still have to understand where you are and do it that way. I think that'll lead us into my next question, which is your defensive coordinator. Like, what were the drawbacks, if there are any, to the fact that you've had success doing this at other places? So, I think the one drawback was the players were very concerned. They're like, Coach, you went to Temple. You guys went 2-10. and 10. You guys went to Baylor. You were 1-11. You didn't play the older guys. You played just the young guys. And that's why I said earlier, hey, I think this team already went through these challenges that you had to go through. Because I saw the humility of Luke Reimer. I saw Garrett Nelson, how much he wanted to come back, even though it was completely right for him to go to the NFL. How much he wanted to, he wanted to say, like, you know what, I, I, I did it. I won here. Like, he, he had a sense of legacy. And so that was humbling. And so, but that's the hard part. They all expect, like, hey, this is how you've done it, like, to flip it. Um, I, I'll just say this on a personal level because, you know, because when you say, like, hey, I've done it before, I've got this, I have nothing. I wake up scared to death every day that I'm not going to do right. I have a sense of urge. And I, it, let me tell you something right now. My kids spent the last three years watching me struggle and watching me, you know, uh, uh, fail. Like, it, 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 it is what it is. Like, my kids my, like my kids came to the spring game and they probably had a little nervousness because the last football games they've been to, they've had, you know, people in the stands chanting to fire me. Like, you know, my son's a friend. You know, like, we went out to eat and they're like, are we okay to go out to eat? Because we couldn't really go out to eat in Charlotte because we didn't know how people were going to treat me in front of my family and we say there's people at Charlotte are great but when you're going through it it can be so so yeah there's no complacency I can promise you like I I uh I am I am at a whole other level in terms of what I want to get done and the best thing that ever happened to me was happening to me in Charlotte you know because like so I took I took over in Charlotte I took over for a very successful coach and Ron Rivera who you know gave to the SPCA was a part of the community people loved him and I got there and there was COVID and no one ever saw me and I saw then how when struggles happened, no one knew me. No one could connect with me. And so people were like, man, you're everywhere. Well, because I know how important it is that people see me not as the coach at Nebraska, but their coach, like both for the good times and the bad times. And then I go out recruiting in the state of Nebraska and I go to Scott's Bluff and we just stop in to get some wings before we go to Brock Newton's house. And uh, we're at, I think it's, I think it's, uh, please forgive me, it's Scott, Skyline or Sky. It's a great, it's a great, it's a great tavern out there. And also people are coming up to me and they're talking to me and I can feel how much they need this. And then, man, we were sitting there the one day and, 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 and Jane Green was addressing the staff and she's talking about all these moments in her life, her family's life, how they were so interwoven with Nebraska football, how like growing up and, you know, maybe you grew up on a farm, maybe you grew up in a small town and you couldn't always get to eat Lincoln and you couldn't always see your aunts and uncles, but either around the TV or here, these great moments happen around this. Yeah, it's it's humbling. It's not like this everywhere. It's humbling. And so people will say, like, how are you handling the fishbowl? How are you handling that? I signed up for this because I want I want to be their coach. I want to be the state's coach. Sat wants to be the state's offensive coordinator. So I say I'll have to say, like, there's, like, everything that happens to us, that's why I said we learn from the past, we don't live in the past. Everything that happens to us puts us in these moments. And... I come here completely humble, like completely, like I don't have it figured out, trying every day. That's why I go to Coach Osborne and say, tell me, I spent an hour this morning with Ron Brown, like, Coach, walk me through your old toss G play. Walk me through 31-39 sprint. Walk me through, do uh, you knew that one? <laughs> so, but like, I'm not saying we're going to do those things. It's a blueprint, though. How did you guys do this? Because I'm scared to death. Uh, not that I'm not confident, but I'm scared to death that I'm not going to put an honest day's work in. And so, 
Um, that's, that's the unique thing, like some, some success doing it, some success doing it, no success at this place. Now you're here. I want to do it at the highest level. I want to get this place back to what it should be for the state. How do I do it? But also enough humility to say, please tell me, help me, help me figure out how we do this. So this kind of brings one of the changes. We're looking at a lot of familiarity. Coops, a lot of your guys have been with you. Coach White, your defensive coordinator, has not. Brings a couple of his guys with him. Getting out of your comfort zone. I would say for me, because a lot's been made that I knew Tony, but not really. Like, I knew him, like, as a guy and stayed in touch with him. Um, but I think when you're looking at defense, okay, I think when you're looking at O-line coaches and you're looking at defensive line coaches, just show me the tape. Show me the practice tape. Show me the game tape. And I like the way Tony's guys played. You know, he's playing with a 240-pound end. He's playing with a 260-pound nose. And they're doing things that are disruptive. And then when I met with him and interviewed him, I could, I could feel his humility. I could sense how smart he was. And he had answers. And I, I had a player say to me, Coach, does it make you nervous that we're going to run the 3-3-5 and no other team in the Big Ten does it? And I think the other way. I'm like, I'm more of an outlier guy. Like, I'm so excited that we're going to be the only person doing this. And then I talked to Coach Oswald. He talked about running the option and how hard it was for people to get ready for them in three days. So I want to be different. I don't want to do what everyone else in the Big Ten's doing. That's safe. And I don't want to be safe. So, yeah, it's different for me, you know. And, and, and I have so much respect for Tony that I said, hey, the D-line coach is a former player of mine. The DB coach is a former player of mine. The linebacker coach is a former player of mine. Oh, and I'm going to add you in the room. Now, he brought, he brought a couple of quality control coaches around and a, and a great analyst in Kevin McGarry, and they've been awesome. Uh, they've become, they're not just his guys now, they're my guys too. But um, I'm excited. And his humility and his willingness to say like, hey, I'll say, hey, we ran this package at Carolina. It was really good for us. Would you take a look at it? Um, he's been really good at it. And I'll say this, I'm talking a lot. I'll shut up, I promise. Um, oh, I got one more. Running on. But, like, I, I look at, like, hiring a new coordinator. I hired Joe Brady. I hired Ben Mack and the people I hadn't worked with. And you learn from your successes and you learn from your failures. And I made a decision with Tony as a new coach. Instead of, like, going through a week and then being like, hey, Tony, why are we doing this? And why are we doing that? Just to let him do it. Like, just to let him, hey, put it in. Do what you do. Don't even worry about me. I'm not going to sit in a meeting. I'm not going to sit in a staff meeting. I'm not going to sit in a unit meeting. You do what you do. And every once in a while, I'll check in and say, hey, I got a couple questions. But, like, don't change. And going through the spring and doing that, now, not in terms of the way we practice, not, but just going through the spring and doing all that and giving him time to kind of put his whole vision together and let him sit there and then him working with Coop and those guys in terms of some of the things we did in Carolina, some of the things we did at Baylor, some of the things we did at Temple. Man, I've, I've been so impressed. And then now that it's our defense, not his defense, I'm sure I'll have plenty of opinions and I'm sure I'll have plenty of things, but I gave him a chance to put it all in and for me to see it in its totality. And, and I didn't ruin his flow. And so I think the players look at him and they see that, hey, he, he, he's the DC. He's going he's gonna, to he's gonna write that ship. And um, so I, I learned from my mistakes. I'm with other guys and try to do a better job this time. All right, one more. Get you out of here. Uh, one of the couple of times that I've seen you bristle up a little was it seemingly was in defense of Coach McGuire, right? That came with a lot, probably the most, I don't know if criticism is the word, but was the most heavily scrutinized of the decisions in the youth. And you talked about recruiting and people using it against him. And that was a different side of Coach Rule. But my, my I didn't take... Uh, he's um, defending a hire. I looked at it as he's protecting his family, right? Because you talked about all the things that he brought to the table, how you've known him, you got into his dad. It didn't seem to be def defending a particular hire as much as you feel like one of your guys was under fire. Is, is that accurate? I'd say it's two things, okay? Uh, number one, like has, has, has the coaching staff like being really nervous about what the fan base is going to say and, and, and acquiescing to that. Has that worked out? Like, don't, like has that, like, and, and I know Coach Osborne was in a different era, but like Coach Osborne did what he thought was right and it worked out. So like, why don't we just do it that way? Like, you know what? Like, why don't I just, like, why don't I just do it that way? Four and eight, let you do your job. Yeah, I'm saying like, I'm going to say that disrespectfully. Like, I'm talking about like, like I don't, people say things to me all the time and I love it. I love the conversations. Um, and if people want to say something, they say, like, I, I went on the bus with the boys and Will Compton asked me to my face. I got no problem with that. 
But like the chatter behind, the, like the sato voce, the soft voice, like it's like, come on, man, how has this worked out for us? Like, how has it worked out? Like, I'm saying, so like, is that what we want? Is that what we, so you so you want the coach to then be nervous about everything that he does and huh, I'm going to make the fans happy and because I make this fan happy, I'm not going to make this fan happy. Like winning makes us happy. We are lucky to have Garrett. Garrett's a gangster. Garrett's a difference maker. Like, you know, I have one of the top receivers in the country. He said, you know, what he asked me today, how long are you going to be able to keep him? So like, everyone, stop. Like, but my point there was, my point there was uh, that day. I mean, I had a parent of, and they're like, well, you know, I had a parent say to me, well, I'm worried about receiver coach. And you know what? She was worried about it because she's reading our fans. She's like, your old fans are saying this, so how can it be true? And I'm like, no, and we worked through it. I'm like, well, just, have, have you have you met with him? Have you talked to him? We are lucky to have him, and we ha we have a chance of stability. Like William Nixon played here. He he's my he's like my godson. His 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 father's one of my best friends. Like William, we grew up together. Like like he came to play here. I think in two or three years, he had a couple different receiver coaches. Like that doesn't work. That doesn't work. So. We're coming from a place where we've had three receiver coaches in four or five years, and, and now I hire a guy that I know is going to be with me for a while and going to grow into the job and be elite, and we're complaining about it. Like, And I don't, again, fans, you have the right to complain. I don't like it when it's like out there and it comes to me. Because when it comes to me, I'm like, I'm going to defend my guy. I'm, I defend my hire. I don't, trust me, bro. Like, I'm only doing this job because I love coaching. Like, I've, 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 I, I wanted my family to live here in Lincoln. We thought it was the right place for our family, and we I truly mean that. I wanted to work with the young people. I'm not doing it for any other reason. I'm not doing it for my ego. Like My ego probably would have been better if I had taken a TV job and, and just played golf and done some TV. I'm doing this because I love coaching. I love football, and I feel this strong mission to do something right because I feel like Nebraska getting back would be right for college football, and it would be right for the state, and I really like the people I've met in the state. So I just... um. I was very candid there. I'm sorry, but I'm going to always defend my guys because um, this is hard. This is a hard job. And I don't mind it when, you know, the coach at, you know, some SEC school saying, hey, he's he's a don't go there because of this position coach. I don't mind it when the coach at some Pac-12 school we rivals with says, hey, don't go there because of this. That shouldn't be us, right? It shouldn't be us that the, the recruits are reading. But if it is, it is. And um, hopefully, hopefully I didn't come across disrespectfully when I did it. I just was like, we're lucky to have them. It, it, those are just those built-in guardrails to keep you from being complacent, right? As you said, you, you don't want your guys thinking this is Disneyland. No, it's going to be something. There's no doubt. Yeah, there's no doubt. And you know what? It should, it, we should be uncomfortable. Like your comfort zone, your comfort zone is the casket where you bury your dreams. And so we don't, we don't ever want to be comfortable. I stole that from a book. It's not my line. But I said it to a couple of our guys lately. Like we don't need to be comfortable. We need to have a high sense of urgency and, Good for Garrett as a young coach to have some scrutiny out there. You know what? Because he's now he's got to go produce. He's got to go produce, and you know what? Like, hey, can you know? Can he get Xavier Best back on track? Can he get Marcus Washington to be a good player? Can he get Billy Kemp to learn the offense coming in from a new school? Can he get Josh Fleece to learn the offense coming in from? New, it's a lot of change over in the receiver room. Can he get some young players coming in to play well? Can we get some receivers committed? Um, I bet you the answer will be yes. Coach, appreciate your time. Yeah, appreciate you, bro. Always a good one.